In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer a lot of fitness and health questions that are asked by viewers and listeners just like you. But the, for the first 43 minutes, we do an introductory portion. This is where we talk about current events. We talk about studies. We tell stories. We have a lot of fun. If you want to be entertained as well as informed, listen to the whole episode. If you just want the fitness stuff, fast forward 43 minutes. So let me give you a breakdown of the whole episode. We open up by talking about our newest uh, sponsor, Dr. Squatch. They make soap and products that make you smell like a champion. No joke. Uh, check this out. If you want to get the Mind Pump discount on all of the products, here's what you do. Go to drsquatch.com. That's D-R-S-Q-U-A-T-C-H.com forward slash Mind Pump. You'll get 20% off all of their products with the code Mind pump. Then we talked about childbirth and the fear surrounding childbirth. My wife is in her third trimester, so we had a good conversation there. Then we talked about the blast in Beirut. Uh, crazy, crazy, crazy explosion it over was there. just fireworks. Uh, then we talked about uh, Adam's son uh, meeting horses for the first time. He's a cute little kid. It was a lot of fun. It's come full circle, hasn't it? We talked about how Disney stock is going up, even though it shouldn't. doesn't make any sense. And how they're releasing Mulan on Disney+. Plus. That's exciting. Yeah. Then we talked about Arizona gyms being able to reopen soon. Awesome. Oh, I'm proud of you, Arizona. Very good. Uh, I talked about an article on the paths to millionaire and the fastest path to becoming a millionaire. Um, and then we talked about uh, parenting. We had a good conversation about parenting there. Then we got into the questions. First question, this person's neck hurts every time they do curls. They'd like a substitute. So we talk about how to avoid neck pain while doing certain exercises. Also in that question, I talked about natural supplements that can help with inflammation and reduce pain through the natural process of uh, inflammation regulation. One such product is made by a company called Organifi. It's called Move. It's very effective. Now, it doesn't block inflammation like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It helps your body have good healthy levels of inflammation because you need inflammation. Inflammation signals your body to repair and build, build muscle, for example. Uh, but if you have too much, sometimes you can get a lot of pain. So the supplement move helps regulate that. If you'd like to check out that product or other Organifi products, use our discount code. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pumping at 20% off. The next question, this person is uh, 50 years old, been lifting weights for 25 years and has been training the same essentially for that whole time, mm. Needs wants to know if they should reduce their volume or increase their volume or what they should do to train differently now that they're over 50. The next question... Shake it up. This person wants to know if we had to eliminate the big three exercises, that's the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift, what would we replace them with? And the final question, this person wants to know what resources uh, and books and things that we've studied that had a huge impact on our current programs. Also, this month, all month long, MAPS Performance is 50% off. This is a phenomenal program for muscle building, metabolism boosting, fat burning, but it's also really, really fun. It is not uh, a traditional workout. So you're going to be doing non-traditional exercises. You also have an explosive phase at the end of the program where you actually work on your power output. If you've never done explosive training, you'll love this. It's a great way to get the muscles to really respond, but also add more speed to your lifts. And a lot of people, when they do explosive training, they come back to their squats, their deadlifts, and their presses, and they find that they've increased their lifts by 10 or 15% oftentimes just from being more explosive. Here's how you get 50% off MAPS performance. Just go to the site mapsgreen.com. That's M-A-P-S-G-R-E-E-N.com and use the code GREEN50. That's G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space, for the discount. I am I'm so pumped to introduce uh, this new partner. This has been over a year uh, we had been working on on getting this company and uh, I can't remember when I first fell uh, into or fell came across one of their commercials and I just I died laughing. I, I love the brand. We reached out, started talking to the owners, love the owners. And they had just, at that time, they were just starting up, really. They hadn't done any real advertising. Uh, we will officially be the first, and we're the only, as of right now, podcast that is partnered with this company. 
and uh, I've been loving their product for a long time. Love the company. It's Dr. Squatch, which is a soap shampoo Boom. business. Uh, yeah. All organic, all natural ingredients that are in it. Smells amazing, yeah. and they're fucking hilarious and so aligned partnership-wise. Chances are you've seen their commercial. It's hilarious. Uh, it, it, I've seen it on YouTube multiple times, uh, but yeah, I got to use their their soaps, and it's great, man. They have all these different uh, types of scents. Like One of them had actually like a coffee- Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, that was my favorite, too. That yeah. and then the, the nautical one, but yeah- it, it it doesn't leave that like filmy kind of feeling afterwards too, which is like oh I'm on the basil peppermint dude yeah I like I like peppermint type smell on my on my soap it just it's amazing so it got me some action <laughs> okay. um, I mean straight so, up yeah which is it's, straight it's a up done deal I, now, I, yeah. I got it I put it in the shower because it smells really good right it's mm. it's natural smell so it's not like fake. And uh, I had it in the shower and, you know, washed myself, come out, and Jessica's like, oh, my God, <laughs> you smell amazing. And I'm like, hey. You know what's hey, funny? Here who we go. You know who markets that way is that Smelly. the brand Axe, and I think that stuff smells like dog shit. Dude, yeah, uh, no. It's, 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 it's like, yeah. way too, like, much perfume oh, stuff they well, put in there. it smells like full-on chemical. I feel like they should name yeah. their scents, like, douchebag. Like, can you smell it? You're like... <laughs> Way to way to insult like half the audience. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's like it's like That's you're right, wearing. Get them to switch. Use axe. Get them to yeah. switch over. It's right like now. you're wearing an Ed Hardy shirt. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh uh, god, it's the same uh, thing. Right? You're gonna double down on them, huh? Oh, Just yeah. keep on like going. A, like yeah. a V-neck Ed Hardy. You know, oh, walk by. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's like god. your tap out yeah. shorts. Yeah. You know, v- vodka like, Red oh, Bull. You know what I mean? Those people. Those people were like, just late to the party. There was a time that was cool. That was you. That's why. I had the full. I told you we you had, had this, the puka yeah, shells, yeah. the V neck, yeah. Ed Hardy, Listen, Axe, yeah, the body backward, spray. Backward no, I, did, I, I, I never hair. had Axe. I had puka shells when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. And I had Ed Hardy before it was ever in TJ Maxx. So hey, I got was, a question for yeah. you. What's up? I got a question. What's up? You have to be honest. Though. Did uh, you ever wear the? Did you ever wear them around your your? your no, ankle? I never did the anklets, dude. I just never. You did didn't do anklets. any of the any of the things around your ankle. No, no, no. I missed that part of the phase. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. I just picture Adam, you know what I mean, in the club? Yeah. And he just stop, back, like, stop it. You know what I mean? Put mm-hmm. sunglasses on, like, man, it's already dark. Why you are saying? not allowed to even have this conversation. <laughs> say hell. You are not allowed to be in this conversation. So, no, absolutely not. I'm so allowed. Oh, no, man. you are not. Because I'm, oh. I'm so far on the other end, it's yeah. easy for me to see. You know <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. You know what I'm saying? You would no style if it bit you in the ass. Uh, huh? Get out of here with that. You would no style if it bit hey, you in the ass. I, I have, uh, uh, have the... I, I, have, had some, I had some douchey looks. Did you? If I think back to I mean... Did you guys ever there, watch? There, the one was like, okay, I had my hat where I would put it up and then I would hairspray my bangs to go like up into my hat. Dude. But I, I feel like it, 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 it's- That was the style it's back only, then. Yeah, right. It's only douchey when it falls out of favor like for a year or two and someone still is doing it or just gets uh, on board. It, That's yeah, a, it was douchey then. So yeah, here, look, you guys are- it. Well, you're you, a kid. You stop really, it, Jinko yeah. jeans. Hey, those were, <laughs> hey, yeah. douchey, you're right. So uh, you guys are watch Enter the Dragon with, with uh, Bruce Lee. Yeah. When he's on the boat in Hong Kong and he's, he's got with the fighter are coming in and one of the fighters like what st-? he's like what style do you know and bruce lee and he's like throwing punches in the air or whatever and bruce lee's like i uh, i have i do the style without you know the fighting style without fighting or whatever what's your style my style you can call it the art of fighting without fighting the art of fighting without fighting show me some of it later Don't try to pull yourself up. Let go the line. My style is the style without style. It's the same. It's like Bruce Lee's kung fu. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's <laughs> great analogy for Good style. Stuff. Hey, yeah, um, I'm right over. Hey, I've been learning a lot about some interesting stuff about <laughs> learning uh, about childbirth. Yeah, I know. Good, good uh, segue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about babies coming Some out. Some interesting yeah. thing happened. Well, you know, okay, so obviously Jessica's uh, third trimester. We're going to be having a baby soon. And um, th- there was a documentary we watched a long time ago. It was the very baby, transformative. The, the baby one or the- Yeah, the business of being born. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. Uh, so along, this is for people who, who didn't listen to this episode. A long time ago, we did, you know, we would talk about these topics. And I talked about how childbirth was so dangerous and women would, used to die all the time. And thank God for Western medicine because it, it, it's no longer a major, you know, death risk or whatever. You got checked. I did by a midwife. I yeah. had a mid. So midwives are the uh, the legit experts on natural childbirth, more so than even um, uh, doctors. Doctors are experts at what they do. Midwives are experts just at 
childbirth and natural. One of the of best investments that we've made in Max, in my opinion. Yes, I mean they're having just, that, having them as a support. Oh, incredible! Right, so um, so a midwife contacted me. It's like you're totally wrong. It's a very natural process. The way we treat it is totally wrong. And, you know, I try to be open-minded. I'm like, well, I admit this is not an area of expertise. And so I did some study, watched that documentary. And, you know, the way we treat childbirth uh, is like we, the way we treat a lot of things in Western Business. medicine. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a medical emergency. It's a medical emergency. Right? And so w- here's something that's very interesting about this. So the muscles around the cervix or the, the muscles that, that control the opening and closing of the cervix are a sphincter muscle. So sphincter muscles are circular muscles that when you tighten, they shrink and tighten up. Like your butthole. As sphincters say what. Exactly. And, uh, and, and open up when they're relaxed. Okay. And so here's a big problem. Now, uh, since none of us uh, have ever had a baby or never will have a baby, I know it's 2020, but still not going to happen. Let's <laughs> yeah. say- uh, like We're still in reality. You're here. trying to poop. Okay. You're trying to go poop, and you're, but you're terrified, anxious, and scared. Is, are you going to be able to have any poop come out? Yeah. <laughs> you're not, right? Because everything's uh, is tightened up. Mm. Those muscles automatically- tighten up when you're scared or anxious or fearful. That's what they do. It's hard to relax sphincter well, muscles. Th- so when women go into childbirth with all this fear and, and, and the way we treat it is like, oh, it's a murder. You watch movies. Oh, my God, my wife's go- you know, going to have a baby. And everybody's so scared. It, it reduces the, 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 the percentage of women that can have natural childbirth because those muscles – Want to stay tight. What do you think too about the mm-hmm. theory of like, you know, we don't we don't uh, train the pelvic floor muscles as much as what we used to. I mean, think about back in the days when you'd be in a squatted position and probably gathering things and working those muscles and being connected yes. to that and the importance of that, and then also the drugs that you use to numb all that. To me, I think that's a part of the reason why everything becomes a medical emergency with child with child birthing is that. You go in it, you're you're to your point, and that's the first phase. Is like you're you're freaked out, you're scared. You're tense, they're you're constantly tight. checking. Oh, three right. centimeters. For, oh, you're not moving fast right. enough. Oh, let's give you the epidural. Let's give you so oh, pitocin. Pitocin first, first mm-hmm. yeah. Then the epidural, right? And then you get that, and then it numbs you from like the waist down. And we know, like you know, when you're trying to activate or work any muscle on the body, how important it is to be able to feel it and be connected be, to it. Yeah. And so you're asking a woman to be numb in that area and to to try and help push it through. Yeah, but not yeah. be able to feel it, which, and then you're already somebody who doesn't train pelvic floor muscles and doesn't have a good connection there as it is. I just well, think it. Well, C-section rates now are through the roof and there's this theory, uh, midwives talk about it all the time, uh, all the time, I should say, where it's this cascading, uh, I can't remember the term they use, but essentially you're doing medical interventions that then lead to more medical interventions. So, mm-hmm. so like phase one, you go into the hospital you're freaking out. They're constantly checking your cervix. Oh, you're not moving fast enough. And so now you're you're kind of scared. You feel like, oh, I'm not, what's going on? I'm not moving fast. It's not happening quick enough. I'm already in a hospital, which is like an emergency place. So then in order to progress your the process, because they say it's not happening fast enough, mm-hmm. and we all know, you know, part of the reasons I think why they say that is they got to get you out. They need the bed. Uh, um. they, they need the bed. But anyway, so they say you're not moving fast enough. Give you Pitocin. Pitocin makes the contractions unbearable, mm-hmm. very powerful, mm-hmm. unbearable. So now you've got that. Now your pain goes through the roof, which leads to epidural. With an epidural, you can't often you can't stand, you can't squat, you can't move. You don't. You're disconnected. You lay down, which, which then leads to you can't get the baby out, and that leads to then we got to cut the baby out with a with a C-section. Right. So they they call it this. I can't remember the term they use, but it's like it's like one step after another leads to this big intervention, which is surgery. Oh yeah. That's why it's, it's really helpful to have an advocate, you know, on your side. And so like uh, much like the, the midwife, we had a doula basically with a a set of, of sort of things that we were trying to make sure that we, uh, you know, we're able to kind of assess things slowly and have like different positions that we could try. And because they don't even want to like, because it's such a machine, like the way that they go through these procedures and they try to get you to uh, have, uh, you know, get to the point of it all without any discomfort. Like Mm. they're trying to solve like a discomfort. Uh, And and so anytime there's any kind of noise or anything, there's, there's always this, this, this rush to get, uh, you know, the pain solved. Well, Well, and imagine too, as a, as a woman, and, and you have a doctor who's telling you, let's do this or let's do that, or we should do this. And you're vulnerable. Yeah, yeah of course you're vulnerable. You're in pain. This is the first time maybe you've done this. You're freaking out. Like it, it's well, well, we know real easy to listen to a doctor telling you, like, hey, let's do yeah. this next. And I remember our duel was like, no. Like it, if that was the, the biggest thing that I got from it was the support like that. Because mm-hmm. 
I would never win in the in the heat of the moment when that was happening. If it was the doctor saying this way, and I even if I hey, we want to go natural, hun, we want to go. Doesn't matter at that point if he's saying, "Oh, let's go this route," and I I'm all I'm he's right away. Yeah, yeah, I'm right away vetoed in that situation. But with the support of the doula, she would look back at her and be like, "You're okay. You're doing great yeah. right now. You're Just fine." Just get the baby to rotate yes. and certain things yeah. to happen. You know, like it's, yeah, it's it, it it's totally like an emergency situation, high stress, and so like to have uh, somebody there to kind of be your advocates. Uh, I totally, yeah, and I, I do want to say this uh, you know obviously uh, as an observer it's easy for me to say certain things i've never experienced uh childbirth i have tremendous respect uh for the whole process um i've, I've witnessed you know both of my kids being born obviously i have another one uh, coming along the way but I, here's something that i've also understood uh just through fitness and and through you know understanding the human body through health is that there you have pain and discomfort and then there's a second part of it which is the perception of them and I, for example, if you're if something hurts but you know it's not damaging or dangerous, you tend to perceive it differently than if something hurts and you know it's this is natural, it's supposed to happen. For example, when you're working out, the kind of pain that you feel when you're working out, you learn to perceive it differently. You still feel it. Workouts still hurt for me like they did when I first worked out. Right. But I don't they're not unbearable like they might have been the first time because I know I'm I'm familiar, I understand it. This is normal soreness. How many times have you had a client get sore? They've never felt sore before and they freak out. Or even in the middle of yeah. the workout, the first time they feel it burning. That's right. You know that's what I'm right. saying? If you've never worked out before and that burning, oh, it's burning, I've stopped. That's right. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> that's right. And historically, you know, that the way that was happened is that when she went into birth, you had these these elderly these elder women that were uh, experienced and wise, and they would take the woman away. They'd go in a tent or whatever, uh, and and they'd be very peaceful, very calm. And it would it would it would change the perception of kind of what's going on, and I feel like that plays such a, a huge role. Now that I've done uh, much more research, again, uh, again, I'm far from an expert. So if I'm annoying people right now, that's you know whatever, totally fine. I'm I'm a trainer, but just from my perspective, I think it's all very very interesting. Yeah. Hey, yeah. did you guys see the uh, Beirut or Le Le Lebanon? Oh, the dude. the huge explosion. That was what a massive the explosion. hell was that? That is insane. Now, I, I, did you see the before and after? Yeah, and it, it left a crater. Now, has yeah. anyone done like I have? I didn't dive deep into it because uh, I didn't have the time yesterday. But what was it? I heard rumors, fireworks, then I heard chemicals. Yeah, and that I was, was the first thing that came out that it was like a firework uh, yeah, they know warehouse fireworks. or something. Yeah, yeah right. Dude. So the the, <laughs> the official story is that. There were stored uh, chemicals or you know fireworks, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what went up in flames, and then it, it blew up. People, some people are saying the color of the smoke and the and the mushroom cloud that because it was a massive yeah. explosion. I mean, it, it affected you know miles. Uh, that's how big it was. It looked like a mini nuke. Yeah, when it went off, it was on fire, and so that that's why there's a lot of people actually filming from different angles. And then all of a sudden, you get this just explosion that just it throws you back. Even watching it on video. Yes. Now, now here's some other uh, theories that are coming out. There, Hezbollah, which is the uh, the terrorist uh, organization, um, uh, often funded by the, the government of Iran, basically they say owns that port. Okay, mm. that they 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 own that port, and then that, that was a place that Hezbollah was storing uh, certain types of missile and rocket fuels. And when those burn, they turn white. That's why the smoke they're saying was white, and why it was such a huh. massive explosion. Mm. And now there's a big uh, cover up uh, that's going on. Other people say that it, that maybe it was Israel that saw what what was happening there and attacked this port, which I hope that's not true because a lot of innocent people right. died. But those are the, the those are not the official you know story of what's yeah yeah it's interesting yeah I wonder how we're gonna find out like what happened or if they're gonna release that or it's just gonna be like one of those things in the news cycle that just kind of goes away. What's now, the death count at? Do you guys know how many? I people think are? it's up to. I know last time I checked, I think it was close to a hundred. I know it was like seventy something, and then and was, probably a lot more injured, right? I imagine because yeah, that was it. It definitely there was one video where someone was driving on a bridge and then there's the, the there's like a bunch of like the water separates the bridge from the area where the fire was and it's far it's like if you're oh I thought that was a boat video that's right no that was. someone was in a car they were driving and they were filming it from their car and I mean it's it's far away you you would think you're totally safe yeah. for the distance then the explosion goes off and the shock waves 
It, it knocked the car on its side. Yeah. All the airbags went out. The rear view like mirror blew 20 off. 20 seconds, and all of a sudden, boom, then the shockwave hits, and it just shakes everything So up. 135 dead count, or death count, and then 5,000 were wounded. Yeah, they said they're blaming wow. it on a 2,700-ton ammonium nitrate stash is what, uh, what, is is what that, the official- What is that for? Uh, I not I th- was that fertilizer and explosives and explosives. Mm. Yeah. So oh, wow. I don't know. That's crazy though. I mean, the before and after picture is just yeah. It's just imagine being there, surviving. You would think that. Uh, what would you think? There's we're at war. Yeah. Yeah. You would have thought a bomb hit. So, yeah. That's somebody what it looks just like. dropped a bomb on it. It it was crazy. It was uh, just like a, a huge explosion. Oh, it's in, it's insane. And, and when you can see the the shock wave moving out for miles. And, you know, taking things out. I mean, it's just uh, scary. Very, very mm-hmm. scary. So, you know, I hope the people out there are the best. I hope that people are doing okay out there. So, anyway, we'll see what happens. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask you, Adam. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw you post a video of your – of. it looks like you took your son to, to see some horses. And Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he uh, – I took him over to see my dad. My dad has a, a ranch, and they have uh, – they breed horses. And so that was the first time that he had actually uh, – seen it did you guys sound my sound went a little that weird was right there. Ju- that was justin oh it was justin that Sorry. went so weird like that no it's okay uh you know we took him we took him over to my dad's um ranch and they they breed and sell horses over there and so that was the first time that he's seen a horse right so it's in person right obviously it books and stuff and i've been waiting to see how he would be around like farm animals and if he's because he's just now really in the last like two months or so i think really becoming aware of everything and like pointing and looking at things so it was cool to see his reaction. So that sent us on this like, oh, you know, he's almost ready to go take him to like a zoo or do something. You know what I found in Sonoma, you guys? What? Mm. This is so badass. And they, they, it's a it's glamping, right? So you can go <laughs> you can go stay. You and Courtney. This is in Sonoma, right? I, yeah. I didn't even think that we had something like this. Oh, is this the African, like the big- uh, Safari. Safari. Yeah. You, I've and, heard and about you, this. Courtney stayed there, yeah. She did? Yeah. Is so, it good? Did she like it? Loved it, yeah. Okay. She's trying to get me and the kids to go up and, and, and check it out. So I want to take Max. We want to wait until he can kind of, wa- where he should be walking any day now. Like, I want to take him when he's walking at least. I think it's like 500 a night, and you stay in these bungalows in like this little mini safari. Yeah, and then you get up and get to drive. Just like giraffes, and yeah, stuff, like yeah, just hanging out. Yeah, it's like a zoo that's like on this property. Is it open right now? Uh, I believe so. No way. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's open. Oh, I'm gonna. It go was there. one of those. We were actually worried because um, remember when they had all those fires up in Sonoma? Like, I guess uh, it, it it made its way through and didn't affect that particular uh, winery. But. I didn't even know we had something like that over here. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, thought that was so random. I heard, I heard about it like once or twice, and then I forgot. Yeah, all about it. Really? And, yeah, and I was like, "Oh, we got to go." And I yeah, all about Katrina it. found it. I mean, that what sparked it was the horse, right? Us being with the with him and seeing the way. Wow, look at the bungalow. So Doug just pulled it up. Yeah, right Safari now. West. This is it. Yeah. Wow, that's legit. Well, so another thing too. You don't need to get a bunch of ma- malaria sh- drugs yeah. and shots. To go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, another thing to to consider, Adam. Like, um, so there's other ways to glamp, and so this is. I've been trying to get the kids to actually camp with me, you know, and like go like camping and like rough it a bit. And like Courtney's not interested at all in that. So uh, I, uh, she's pulling me into some, I guess there's a way that you can uh, basically rent out a trailer that they drop off at one of those campsites at, at, ahead of time. So you have it all set up and all that stuff. And then like it's a whole community of these like uh, trailers. Yeah. And and so again, it has like pool there and it's like. The so whole, I've seen those. Those are like the Airstreams. Yeah, wait a minute. So I know somebody who just did that. You just drive up and it's there. You just—it's already there for you, and then they take it away when you leave. <laughs> it's just like I'm like I'm lazy. So I I've, I've haven't seen that. that. I've seen the ones that are like they're actually they they're like RV parks that mm-hmm. are like really yeah. nice, a pool, amenities, fire pits, everything like that, like really nice camping grounds. And then it's all those air streams that have been kind of gutted and then customized to look like a hotel room. Yeah. So it's like you get it's this. It's like ca- that. They're just like putting, they're, they're rolling trailers in <laughs> at, at a similar park just like that. Oh, oh wow. That's, yeah, that's for you. 100% what I would do. Yeah. yeah. 100%. I'm like all trying to, you know, be out there and uh, uh, pitch my own tent and do all that kind of stuff and, and teach them things about roughing it. But it's like she's, uh, anyways, I also do that on my own. I guess. My, my sister and, and, and Tom, they just bought, uh, uh, those ATXs, which are like the the um, the little like uh, off road ATVs. But yeah, those are awesome. Bro, you know, Didn't you know they what, sell them at. Uh, do you know how much those are? Aren't they like twelve grand? Twenty six thousand. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Woo. 
That's a straight car payment. Are those, it is a car. Are right they there. legal on the road? No. Okay, so I was actually talking to my sister this morning about this. So you can drive things like that, including like my, my ATV. You can, for up to two miles is the law. So for two miles, and the reason Wait, why that two it, miles on the road, yeah, how but, do they know? Well, it's because well, it's because it's an off road vehicle. You can't drive it on the road. You can't. Mm-hmm. You could. We'll never see that driving downtown or some mm-hmm. shit like that. But the the theory or the idea is this: is that you know trails aren't always link. You got to sometimes cross over a freeway or do something. So they oh. allow they allow that right. It's so like when, a, when a tractor comes on the yeah, freeway. exactly. The, you're allowed two miles. You're allowed two miles with these off road vehicles to be on public roads. Dude, so you still have you don't, yours, don't you? Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> It's gonna be. I know. I forgot about that. I too, forgot. Yeah. Where'd it's you coming, put it? It's coming up there, dude. I'm gonna. I'm getting. I'm the chain on. It, I told you. I broke the chain riding it not that long ago when I got mm-hmm. it all fixed. Or Katrina got it all fixed for my birthday last year, and uh, I snapped the chain. And then I was like, oh shit. Of course, I just got this running, and then the chain snapped. So then it's sitting over in my brother-in-law's uh, barn and it's covered up. And we just fire it up every month just to make sure that you know the battery doesn't die. But now that my sister has that, and we found out that the Truckee house is like the f- the head of all the main trails mm-hmm. of like Nevada and uh, that whole area. And Tom is like hardcore, like mapping everything out and finding all these rural areas we can go. So Dude, that's fun. They can drive from their house to our house oh, it's on without now. ever hitting a road. From Reno? Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so I'm hey, excited. Hey, did you guys hear about uh, Disney's uh, release that they're going to be doing? No. Okay. So the two, Mul- the Milan thing. Yeah. So two things. Okay. Number one, this is how I swear the stock market makes zero sense. Mm. It does not make any sense right now. Disney comes out with earnings and they tanked, yeah. but because they tanked less than what they less predicted. than what people thought, <laughs> the stock went up. You know, like eleven <laughs> percent. What a weird time. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that wasn't so bad. More yeah. money. You guys sucked, but yeah. not as bad as we thought, you right? Didn't suck that hard. But anyway, so Disney's. Uh, so a lot of people are anticipating this this uh, this adaptation of Mulan, right? Like they did Beauty and the Beast. They yeah. did. I don't remember which well, other they one. They made her like all like this warrior. Like I saw some of the yeah. trailer for it. And it looked interesting. Looks really good. Yeah, Actually, looks good. Mulan's one of my favorite uh, Disney cartoons. Yeah, absolutely love it. So. A lot of people waiting for it. A lot of parents are waiting for it. It was supposed to be released in, in, in March, I believe, but they didn't because of obviously everything that's going on. So they're going to release it on Disney+. Plus. So this oh. is a an actual motion picture Just Disney. skipping all the theaters. All of them yeah. released on Disney+. Plus. Twenty eight. Uh, excuse me, $29 you have to pay. To Don't you see it. this is what's happening? I mean, yeah, the, you kind of have to do that. I right? mean, to me, this is like our, our movie theaters – going to be a thing of the past after COVID. Are we, are the, I think that all these streaming companies, all these mo- production companies have got to figure something out, right? And yeah. the only choice is to go straight to streaming like we're seeing right now. You're seeing that too. You brought it up about Prime. There's stuff that, that, is in, that would be in theater that you can now buy on there for a premium rate. Well, once they people have g- to be going like completely out of business. I mean, it's been so long now with zero revenue. Like, there's no way. Like, how how are they keeping the lights on when they come back? Well, and it's also like once people get a taste. This is the same thing I feel about education. Once people get a taste yeah. of watching these releases at home, and you know, even though it's going to be thirty bucks essentially, I'm still saving a ton of money. I got you know two kids, me Jessica. Plus, you buy whatever. You know, I'm, it's like 70, 80 bucks when yeah. we go to the movies. I'm still saving money. I'm in the comfort of my own home. I could buy whatever snacks. See, I make my own popcorn. This is why we need automated cars because then we could turn our garages into theaters. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like what you're thinking. That, yeah. That's what yeah. I want to do. Mine's a gym. Yeah. <laughs> well, gym <laughs> slash theater. Yeah. But I mean, once people get a taste of this stuff, I think like that's why homeschooling is exploding. People yeah. are getting a taste of it and saying, "Hey, look, I'm, it's not super bad. I think I'm going to go in this direction." Well, it sucks because I wanted to see Maverick in the theater. You know, the the new uh, oh, Top Gun. And, yeah, I was yeah. like all excited to watch that one. That's it. so. There to me, it'll it'll come back, but it'll it'll be like one per town. Like we'll have one in this city. That's how I feel like just for things like that. I mean, yeah. there's there's going to be movies that the experience of going to watch it in IMAX and crazy mm-hmm. surround sound is just. It just doesn't live up to unless you have that unless you've got a ten thousand plus dollar setup in your yeah. living room. Go to Shaq's house. Yeah, 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 very few people have a setup like that. So I, I still see that there there'll be some people that will want to do that, but not enough to be competitive. Not enough for there to be like what what do we have like. 
six or seven yeah. different theaters here. Like I was just so surprised that these drive-in theaters haven't been just rocking, you know, through this whole thing. It's like, I mean, you're in your car, you're obviously social distancing, you you could roll your windows up. What is like, going on with the, the one down the road for us? Is yeah, it one? there's one in Capital, Santa Cruz Capital too Express, that oh, hasn't open. been running. Is it open? It's open. It is open. Yeah, you can go You can go watch movies Like there. new movies or no. just old movies? No, right? they're yeah. doing like double headers of like, you know, uh, Predator and Alien or, you know, <laughs> you know movies that, that you would want to watch together. Hey, look, it's kind of fun. Yeah. If you take this is what you do. You take your kids, especially if you have a big car, you open the back, lay the seats down, put some blankets, bring some snacks. The kids say it's a it's a it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's especially in the summertime, right? Yeah. Hey, did you guys hear about the gyms in Arizona? No, what uh, happened? Uh -uh. Dude, they this, so they won a ruling. So they 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 went against the state, uh, went to court, and now they're 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 going to be allowed to reopen in about a week. So Gyms are going to be allowed to reopen over there. Did you know that Arizona is is Good ranked as, if not the, I think it is the the top uh, fittest state in the country? Did you know that? I thought it was Colorado. No, I think it's Arizona, and maybe maybe it's not the fittest. Maybe it's the most gyms per square foot or something. Okay. I, I know that they have like it's uh, one of the you know most fitness minded states in the country. Mm -hmm. I can't remember when I read that article, but I read that years ago, and I didn't know. I assumed that we would be. I thought that California. Mm. Uh, would be one of the leaders in that we're yeah. not. Yeah, no, I'm really, really happy that that, that they got the opportunity to reopen uh, their gyms in Arizona. And I know people right now are like, eh, it's dangerous. Here's the deal. Uh, yeah, fittest. Go to, go to most most gyms per square yeah, foot. It's, it, it it's your choice to go into a facility like that and take risks. And it's the it's the it's the business that's going to decide how they set that up. It should be. Yeah. So I'm very happy with this uh, with this ruling. Plus. Here's the deal. We do know that uh, you know poor physical health is a major risk factor for Absolutely. severe symptoms of, uh, of you know this pandemic, and so some people this is how they get their, this is how they get all their activity is by going to the gym. So let's see here. Uh, Doug's bringing it up. Colorado was what number nine? Number ten. Uh, number a, one. for most gyms. Oh, Minnesota. Minnesota. Wow. Wow. Really? Minnesota? Minnesota. I would never have guessed that. They have the most gyms per what? Per, per, s per square mile. Really? Mm -hmm. Where's California? Maybe it's a thing to do. Not you even know, top like, 10. Yeah. Especially in the winter. Yeah. Yeah, you I know, wonder you what it was place. for Arizona. You know what? You know why, though? California's got such big expanses of area that are not, nobody's around. Yeah. But I remember when we were in Orange County and, and they were talking about like how many gyms per square foot. They, they were just like right next to each other everywhere. Oh, dude. In Southern California, there's literally blocks where there's like two or three. Well, I wonder if they count. I, I know. I wonder yeah. if they count like CrossFit gyms now too, because that's what's it's that has to that's inflate. Gym. It has to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, uh, everybody. Hey, I, I read a cool article today. Uh, it, the title of it was "The Fastest Path to Becoming a Millionaire." So, you guys want to guess what it is? Like the fastest path. Uh, Saving your money. All right, so there's so there's four ways that they listed that you could become a millionaire. Well, one real, of them is real the estate's fastest. number one. Well, hold on, hold on. Let me let me give you what they because they they labeled them kind of different. Becoming an influencer. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You imagine not. all the you yeah. know all the, think about all the TikTok influencers right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're fucked. <laughs> yeah. TikTok's about to be banned. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, no. Is McDonald's hiring? All right. So here are the four main paths to becoming a multimillionaire. The saver investor path. So this is somebody that makes saving investing part of their daily routine. Yep. Then there's the company climbers path. These are people that work for a large company, devote all of their time and energy to climb the corporate ladder until they land a senior executive position with a very, very high salary. Right. Then there's the, there's the which virtu is really hard to do right. Then there's the virtuoso path, which is the this is people who are the best at what they do, so they're paid a very very high premium for their knowledge uh, knowledge and expertise. So these are people that are like the best of the best in their virtuoso. category. Virtuoso, I love that word. And then there's the dreamers path. The dreamers path are all in pursuit of a dream that is like starting their own business, becoming a successful actor, musician. Or a best-selling author. It says your dreamers love what they do for a living, and their passion shows uh, up in their bank accounts. So, out of those four, which one's the fastest way to becoming a millionaire? I still think it's saver. 
No, virtuosos people. I think they, they they they're the ones that like you can charge a ridiculous yeah. rate. Okay, but so, it's random that the people find them. So it's actually the dreamers. So the dreamers, really? yes, but it's also the most difficult. So first mm. off, the saver and high the, risk, high reward. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. The, and and it didn't say the the safest way or the most guaranteed way, right? It said the fastest yeah. way. Okay. Because I feel like the saver investor path is probably the most. It's the most methodical, consistent. If yeah. you like that, you'll love the millionaire next door. Mike turned me onto that book like a couple months back. I finished reading that a while ago, and that was really good. And they actually the whole book, why I saw, I think you'll love it. Is it's it's all it's all studies, it's all research, it's all they break down the numbers. Numbers. Really? Yeah. The thing that I was most fascinated in was, and I and I'll, I'll probably mess up the exact percentage, but I know it was like really high. Like this was that like eighty percent of like multi millionaires don't drive a car that's worth more than forty grand. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which was like whoa. So like when you see somebody, when you see you know you go down to Santana Row, right? That's an area where we see like all the Lamborghinis and Bentleys and stuff. Now I look at it all differently now, and I think to myself like, damn, how? Yeah. If, if just statistically, if I just saw ten of them go by me. At, at least half of those guys aren't even Dude, really it's balling. A front. Yeah, yeah. They, they've rented it. Wow. Uh, I, I thought that was really. Chicks. I thought that was really fascinating, yeah, bro. It's all. It's like insecurities coming out. It's like no yeah. different. Who's the guy at the bar that wants to start all the fights with everybody? It's not the trained MMA fighter. Well, or I the black think, belt in jujitsu. I don't think it's always. It's the the I don't think it's. Yeah. I don't think you can default to it's always an insecurity. I drive expensive cars. I like cars, and it, you you've alluded to this before about you know where you get joy, right? Like, and yeah. I love to drive. Where I mean, I always drive us everywhere we go. Yeah. I I've liked to drive since I was 16 years old and I love cars. I'm into them. And so I enjoy them. So I don't think it's always a default to like it's insecurities of people. Well, no, but I think I, I, you're vehicles. right. I'm generalizing, but I think a lot of it is. I think it's a lot of these people. Well, that I, I agree with they you. They leverage themselves heavily. They Here's how here. Okay. Here's how I know. Okay. Same place. Santana Row. You're sitting now, right now you have to sit outside. You can't sit inside yeah. at all. So I've been there a few times for, with, for lunch or dinner with uh, Jessica and we're sitting out there. This is what people do with the, they drive by with their Ferrari or Lamborghini. By this is the most douchiest, stupidest thing you could ever do. First of all, you're already driving an amazing yeah. bad. Everyone's going to look at your car well, anyway. They're nerds. They you, need some advantage. You don't <laughs> need to rev your engine well, as you're driving. It's so stupid. You're driving by five miles. <laughs> ring, ring, ring. You know. Oh, oh. Like, oh, God. It's like what we did in high school. Yeah. You know? Like it's just that now all of a sudden they're they're like, ooh, I'm yeah. cool. It's like I'm. You know, like, this is what cool people like did in high school. Yeah. You take your shirt off at the beach. You're like, oh, you know, I need to uh, do some push-ups and stretch. I think it's quick. more. <laughs> I think it's more Freudian than I think it is anything else. That's it's more of a. They want to sleep with. Their moms? No, oh, it's uh, this not that's, not everything is Oedipus fucking. Complex. That's Freudian. I don't know. No, <laughs> Freudian can mean too that these people these this is like men trying to attract women. You know, it's a sexual thing. It's more of them. This is their way of of, yeah. of peacocking, right? Yeah, you this want to is, attract the, the wrong women, I guess. Well, maybe. Oh. I mean, that's yeah, but, look at my car. Yeah, yeah. There's there's still a large a large person. I mean, yeah, we've said it before on this podcast. Like, yeah, uh, what, what do you what do you think game. is a, a more guarantee that that you you find a a, a wife being this uh, nice guy? Or being a rich guy, you know, if you're being, if and that's one of the ways. A good to, wife, a nice guy, yeah, yeah. And just a wife, yeah, yeah. You're, you're yeah probably right. Pre presenting, presenting, and peacocking, so you get attention. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so back to that article. So this guy did a huge study, and he found that 28 percent of the individuals in the study were dreamers. Here's some cool stuff about them. They had an average net worth of 7.4 million. Here's the crazy part. Most of them were able to accumulate the wealth over a period of roughly 12 years. Very short period of time to get to multi-million, especially when you compare hmm. to the other people. Now, it says here, what makes their path so hard? Here's the things about it that are difficult. Very long work hours. The dreamers in the study worked anywhere from 65 to 75 hours per week Ooh. before they finally achieved their dreams. Now, this makes sense. If you're, if it's a dream of yours, you're so passionate and focused, you're just going to work on it yeah, all the time. It's just all consuming. Yep. Here's the stressful lifestyle aspect of it, too. It says, until the dream begins to pay off, making ends meet, can cause almost intolerable financial stress. Totally unknow what this like. You yep. start a business, you grind, and it's funny because people look at a business and be like, wow, you guys crushed out of nowhere. It's like, you don't see the previous 20 years where, right, right. Yeah. you know, whatever. All the foundational work. Uh, high risk. It says dreamers by nature are gamblers. They're willing to put everything they own on the line in order to get to their dream. Mm. And then here's the last one. It's demotivating because they have such high ambitious goals some you know some people try talking them into pursuing another path so imagine if your dream is to start a fitness podcast that's successful for example like like we did and you're doing it for a, a whole year without getting paid like we did imagine you know an impatient spouse or friend it's like hey man you're 
you're not making any money. Yeah. Maybe you it, should just get another it job. It's straining uh, yeah, everybody around happens. you. I yeah. wonder how they measured that because I know in the in the Millionaire Next Door book, they t- they attribute it to real estate because the, a, a large portion of people, even if you didn't have a, a massive high paying job, if you invested yeah. early and you could pay your mortgage, you know, and if you've had the house for yeah. 12 years, you and that and you definitely if you live in California, dude, the, the Bay thing is Area worth a million dollars. And yeah, there's a big difference between net like your worth and how much you actually make because there's a lot of millionaires in California mm. that don't make a lot of money because they bought their houses. Like my grandfather, my grandfather came to this country uh, my, when my mom was four, zero skills. Uh, he, he was you know as a child he's extremely poor, dirt poor. Worked since he was a kid, lived in Venezuela for a while to try and make some money, finally came to California, was a custodian uh, and at schools and cleaned movie theaters. This is how he supported his family. Bought a house. That's back when San Jose was a farm town before the tech industry came here. I think he bought his house for $16,000, right? Yeah. My grandfather now is in his 80s and awesome. his health is, is, worth, is worth at $1.3 or $1.4 million. So on paper, my grandfather is a millionaire, but the man probably never made more than you know, 30, 40 grand a year yeah. in his entire life. Yeah. So I, I got a question for you, Sal. So I was I, I got a new show that I'm watching right now uh, called Yellowstone. It's with Kevin Costner. Okay. Uh, I've been trying to watch that, but I can't it's, figure out where to watch it. it. So yeah, I had to I bought it on Prime. So I had to buy is it. Is it good? On, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I like it. Uh, I'd give it a B minus. Uh, okay. So yeah, it's got me, it's got I wouldn't say it's like one of my top shows, but I I enjoy it. It's 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 a cool a cool show. But the the question that I have for you, so in this show, Kevin Costner is a grandfather who was terrible to his kids, and now he's got this grandchild, and like he's obviously trying to be a, this. And he just and we've talked about this before how you guys see your dads yeah. with your kids, and like what the where was this guy right yeah. right right <laughs> and, Try, and, trying to make up for lost time. Well, and, and a lot of that just is wisdom. yeah. It, well, they're older, they're wiser. They also have uh, they recognize at that time at that point in their lives maybe the mistakes that they made mm-hmm. with raising you guys. Yeah, they're they better were, people. So. The question I have with you, I know you're not a grandfather, but you have this large gap. I look like one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. You have this large gap with having children, and and I'm sure you've already thought a lot about this. Are there things that come to mind that you either wish you would have done different, or there's things that you plan to do now with this this the child that you are about to have that you look at your kids now and you feel like, man, I hundred percent, hundred percent. I got this lesson going through uh, a, a divorce. Um, and you know when you go through a very challenging, painful time, you either become more of what you were or I think you change. And so I, I chose to, to change to try and become better. One of the things I recognized was I just was not nearly as present um, as I should have. I missed a lot with my kids. Most of what I did a lot, of, I worked. I worked a lot and I was constantly thinking about work and focusing on work and reading and trying to become you know, to, to expand my, my knowledge base and all that stuff. Meanwhile, I missed some of the most important moments with my kids, either because I wasn't there or more often than not, I was there, but I was half there and my mind was somewhere else. With this time, I'm going to be far more present. And luckily, we've created a, a, you know, a business that allows that. So the hours aren't like they used to be. But just being present means literally you know, uh, being there, not just thinking about other things or, or waiting to, you know, oh, what I got to do tomorrow or whatever. That's the big one, man. And then patience, like my patience is way, you know, higher. I mean, you, you, I now think do you he- see it? Do you see it in your children's behavior and your relationship though? Cause I, I see your kids and I think you have an incredible relationship with your kids. And, and I don't see like, I mean, you, I know you guys have met you know, older kids, kids that are your age, uh, from other friends or people that you know, and it's to some, it's sometimes obvious. It's like, oh wow, the dad really missed the boat here yeah. with the way the communication or the way you know the way he probably was raising them, and you can see it now as they're turning into teenagers. Um, I don't see that with your kids. So you you say that you weren't very present, but I don't feel like your kids feel like you weren't very present. I think they always felt loved. Um, I always. I'm very affectionate, so I'm not one of those dads that has trouble showing, uh, their, you know, hugging and kissing their kids and expressing how much they love them. And of course, important things I never missed. So like, you know, school events and stuff like that, I always tried to make. But I know, I know that I was not as present as I could have been. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you saying that. It makes me, you know, it feels good to hear that. But 
Uh, I think this time around I'm going to be even better throughout the, but again, you know, I, I'm still raising my other kids. So I still have, now I'm far more present with them. Yeah. But they're, you're, they're before. both at an age now where I think you start to see, uh, cause you know, five to seven is the most, most formidable years when they, when yeah. they, they really start creating those pathways, behaviors. And by the time they start getting into teenagers is when they really start to revolt or really push back on maybe... You see how all the work uh, plays out. Yeah, right. Uh, or the lack of work playing uh, right. out. And I, I just don't see that in your... I don't feel like you're... I don't see any like behaviors that uh, your kids express that I go like, oh, that's probably because Sal wasn't around very yeah, much or yeah. wasn't present. So... I, I think you're probably harder on yourself than what you really that than what you really. Yeah, were. maybe I, you know maybe, but I still I still think like this time around. Plus, here's the big one too. It's like it goes by so fast when they're little. You know, one thing that Facebook does that I, I love and I hate is mm -hmm. you go on the, your feed and it's like seven years ago memories. You know? Yeah, and you see a picture of your kids when they were little, and you automatically want to cry. Not and it's mainly because you missed. That, that when they were that young. Oh my gosh, I remember that. Oh yeah, it's like a video with their little cute little voice. It's oh, like, ah, it hits you so. Me. And sometimes yeah. I can't even look at them. I, I can't look at it. Right. I'm embarrass myself in public. But I, it's it happens so fast. Like your kid right now, it believe. Uh, trust me with this. It's, it goes by, even though now you're present. You're a very present father. I'm sure you're going to look back and be like, oh my gosh, that went by so quick. Oh, we talk about it. We talked about it last night. You know, we were, he was asleep. We just put him down and we're sitting there. We're getting ready to watch. We we're watching that show. And then the, the kid that I'm taught referring to that was a grandkid to Kevin Costner, he's probably five or six years old, somewhere around that range or seven, somewhere in that range. And uh, I was like, God, it's going to be any day. Like, we're going to be having conversations with him. How weird is it to think like right now getting him to do sounds and point and say, dad has like such a big deal. I'm like, like real quick here in a blink of an eye, he's going to have full on conversations. And I was, we were talking about how weird mm. that's going to be and feel yeah. and then be thinking back to these times right now. I definitely feel like, and I'm sure this happens for every parent that um, it just keeps getting better and better. Right. So every, oh, every phase or every new chapter of his life, you know, whether it presents new challenges, oh, he's going to run around and be like, people always talk about all the, the hard stuff, which, yeah. uh, you know, for me, there's a reason why I waited so long because I knew it was fucking hard. I knew that it was a lot of work. I experienced that with my, my two younger siblings. So that I, I, I feel I'm the most prepared for, I was, pre I'm prepared for the sacrifice. I'm prepared for the hard work. Me, I get to, and that, I think maybe that's what allows me to be more present yeah. is I was ready for all that. And so I can really focus on the moments, the fun stuff, and the, the the things that I'll probably look back five, ten years from now and go like, man, do you remember when he, the first time he giggled when the horse came and this and that and was like he was so innocent? Like, I, of I mean, I think older fathers uh, do a good job, but and forget the age part. I think you're some more mature. You're wiser. You're, you're you're settled. You're smart. You're not as you're not chasing certain well, things. Hopefully, he's more selfless, right? More selfless, yeah. But it's uh, watch their watching their personalities develop is really funny. I remember my my son was three. Three and a half, maybe, and uh, you know his pers the personality changes all the time, right? Or, or develops. And I remember like something fell in the cupboard, and my son stops. He was playing with his trains, and he stops and he looks up and he goes, "What was that mysterious sound?" You know, it was like the first. Yeah. At three years old, he said that it was like the first uh, like hint that this kid he's gonna be you know he's gonna be able to express himself verbally you know in, in certain ways. I remember thinking like mysterious. Like, yeah, yeah, where'd you come? Where'd you get that, that word? Dude? That's so cool. I know. Yeah. I, that's what we, we haven't hit this yet. Like that's what I can't wait to see. Uh, our, who, who does he take after more personality wise? Like I see it in Justin's kids. I see it in your kids. Yeah. You know, right now it's too early for us to see. Like, is he more like Katrina? Is he more like me? Is he the perfect blend? You no, can't lose. You guys are both good people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> First question is from Wellner Wellness. Both my husband and I suffer from neck pain and find that bicep work, standard curls, and others aggravate this. What are some bicep workouts we can do? I love this question because this reminds me of the flack that I got on YouTube. Uh, in regards to my bicep curl video. Do you remember that? Oh, you do your split stance? Yeah, the split stance. Oh, they're giving shit about that. Yeah, the split stance and then teaching people to pull the shoulders back and then just coming up to full flexion and where your dumbbell is about to your, you know, right about your nipple line or so and not rotating up, which we know that, you know, full, full range of motion on the bicep requires a little bit uh, of that rolling up of the shoulder. The problem is 
that this is exactly what I came across with clients. Um, either one, they would uh, allow the shoulder to take over uh, a, a lot of the movement and they'd feel, feel it less in their bicep, or it would even aggravate their shoulder uh, because they're in this kind of forward position and then they're moving and rocking up with the bicep curls and then teaching them a more strict form. Uh, one, help them feel it in the bicep more, and then two, eliminate things like this. Yeah, mm. well, okay, so... The big thing for me when I hear questions like this is is a reminder that just because an exercise works a particular body part, it does not mean that the rest of the body is not engaged uh, in some way, right. right? So a bicep curl, single joint exercise, you're bending the elbow, you're just working the biceps. Does this mean your core is not involved? Does this mean that your shoulder girdle doesn't have to be stabilized? Does it mean that your head and neck position aren't right. impo important to pay attention to? If you have a tendency towards neck pain, what a lot of people do with, with exercises is they either shrug their shoulders a lot with all exercises mm -hmm. or they look down or jet their head, down, forward. their head forward. They strain, you know, out of their neck muscles just by the, you know, grinding their way through the exercise. Yeah. So I would say keep your shoulders down, keep your head straight and tall, elongate, create some traction in your spine as you're doing your bicep exercise. The other thing I would say is work on your shoulder and upper back uh, mobility. Um, work on those areas because, you know, if your neck is preventing you from working your biceps, I mean, it's going to prevent you from doing a lot of things, especially exercises like squats and overhead presses and and deadlifts. So I would definitely work on uh, on mobility. Now there are also, of course, supplements that can help with pain and inflammation. Um, although I don't consider these things to be first lines of defense or or, or solutions, they can help. Um, and, and the way that they tend to benefit is they reduce inflammation, which then gets you to move better, which then re helps you reduce future pain. Because when you have some pain already there, sometimes we protect ourselves with certain positions, mm -hmm. which actually contribute to the pain over time. I, I know Organifi has got a great uh, natural anti-inflammatory supplement called Move. Um, in fact, it has astaxanthin in it. Uh, it has that in there. It does because of its anti-inflammatory yeah properties. It's got holy basil in there and other products as well. So you could take that and help reduce the inflammation, mm. but you got to fix your positioning and your mobility. Otherwise, this problem was going to stick yeah, around. Yeah, this was actually a common one I would get from clients mm -hmm. uh, doing bicep curls. Uh, primarily, like you had mentioned, the chin kind of tucking down and like because they're trying to concentrate so hard on what their arms are doing and looking down at it. But also if it's a, you know, a, a heavy amount of weight where um, they're grinding their teeth and they're really squeezing and straining a bit in their face, uh, you know, the neck's not in a favorable position and then they're adding all this extra tension and stress in that area. They, they ended up getting these tension headaches as a result. If you haven't watched the YouTube video I did on bicep curls, I know it's one of the, it's one of the top 10 or top five videos that we've done as far as views. It's pretty easy to find on our uh, Mind Pump TV YouTube channel. Watch that if you want to take it to the next level. So this is where I love. I would love to pull out my PVC pipe. So I would take th this person, I would put them in that splits, I would lighten the load, okay? Especially when we're talking about an isolation exercise. Yeah. You know, d pushing yourself towards the highest dumbbells you can curl uh, or yeah. easy curl. Yeah, nobody can. cares. N Nobody's yeah. bragging about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not even just nobody cares, but the the you're not going to get that much more benefit by lifting 10 more pounds than what you could in a, in a bicep. You get better, better results with more better form. Right, so you lighten the load, uh, you know, watch that video, and then the even the next level to that, is especially I think this person said they're working out with their husband, right? So there's two of them working out together. Mm -hmm. You take uh, the PVC pipe and you you put it behind uh, your partner's back, and you want the the back of their nodule of their head touching it. You want their their upper shoulder blades touching it, and then their low back by their hips touching. Those are the three points that you do not want to lose contact at all and then perform the movement like I teach it in the YouTube video, that should eliminate a lot of the stress that you're feeling in the neck uh, and in the shoulders. And again, just focus on form. So remember, we've talked in, in uh, the previous episodes about progressive overload. You can do that by slowing the tempo down. So lighter weight, slow the tempo down, control the exercise, focus more on the bicep, make sure you're keeping that spine nice and neutral. That's what the PVC pipe is for. Um, that's why I like the split stance. You can also do that with a wall or a squat rack. Um, I do that sometimes with a squat rack where I place instead of using a PVC pipe, I use uh, one of the you know the one of the bars from the the squat rack. 
um, and I'll put that in the middle of my back, or I'll put my back up against the wall. Put your back up against the wall. Keep your shoulder blades, hips. Tuck the chin. And tuck the chin and and, and put that the, the small nodule at the base of your skull against the wall. Keep them all in contact. And if you really want to make it strict, keep your elbows in contact with the wall and then do curls. I like would that. recommend that because part of sometimes with the shoulder aggravation is that last bit of flexion that happens in the shoulders right. engage, and that might be aggravating it. Next question is from Rari Walnuts. I just turned 50 this year, and I'm a, an experienced lifter of 25 years. I have been working out basically the same way as I did when I was 25. Should I be scaling back the reps and volume for heavier weight and lower volume, or should I be adding more reps and volume? Oh, this see, I, I, I like questions like this because I think sometimes we we read what we're supposed to do yeah. based off of our age or our sex or whatever, and we think, oh, we start to question, like, am I should I do this? Because I read this article that says- You shouldn't really be lifting heavy, yeah, right? When, yeah, once you're over 40 that you need to do this or whatever. Okay, nothing is above your listening to your individual body. Okay, mm -hmm. so I can't answer this question because I'm not in your body. I also don't train you in person. Should you scale back? Well, if you're finding that you're getting more aches and pains in your joints, if you're finding that you're having more trouble recovering, then yeah, you might need to scale back a little bit. There may be some other stuff you can look at as well. Should you increase the volume? Well, I mean, are, is it easy? Can you increase the volume and still feel recovered and improve? In which case, then increasing the volume is okay. It all depends on your individual body. It also depends on what you're currently doing. So, if you know, he says, I'm lifting. What is the same as 25, right? So is does that mean you're – and I'm, I'm guessing because you there's an option here to either add volume – or also, or add reps, or also uh, add weight. I'm assuming you probably fall in the muscle building category of the sticking around eight to twelve rep range. And in that case, either direction is going to be very beneficial to you because it's going to be novel. Going down and and, and remember this too that you know uh, heavy at 50 may be different than what heavy at 25 is. So you know maybe you know when you were 25 you were deadlifting 400 pounds. Uh, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to go that heavy just because you've done it before. Heavy now may be 315 pounds, and, and that's what may be, might be challenging for five reps. But the value of you know working down in the three to, rep, three to five rep range, if you never do that or you haven't done that in years or even in, haven't done that in six or eight weeks, that's extremely valuable. Same thing goes for the other direction. If you've been hovering around that eight to 12 rep range and you haven't moved up to 15 to 20 reps for a, a phase or a cycle, uh, that has tremendous value. So yeah, not only knowing what this person is feeling and, and uh, where, where, they're, what, where they're at and what's going on with their body, but also what's going on with their programming. It's uh, not enough information for me to know uh, what they were doing for the last 25 years, whatever you've been doing, uh, moving away from that is one of the best things that you could possibly do right now if all things are healthy and yeah. fine. I'll tell you what, though. If you've been training with traditional resistance training um, in the gym and you've been doing it that way for yeah, 25, 25 years, years, I'll tell you what, uh, MAPS performance will blow you away. Mm -hmm. It'll completely blow you away because of its emphasis on mobility and because of a lot of the movements are non-traditional in that program. So if, if you've been doing traditional, like, you know, bench presses and, and squats and rows and overhead presses, they're kind of the traditional bodybuilding exercises, which are great. There's nothing necessarily wrong with them. Mm -hmm. If you go to a program like MAPS Performance after, after you know, decades of training a particular way, it will literally blow your mind. Yeah. Say go that way. I've actually been going through this with my dad who, who has been doing the same routine for, yeah, about 25, 30 years, you know, similar situation. Uh, but is at a point now where is getting this sort of repetitive stress uh, where it's starting to affect the joints, the knees, the uh, his hips. Uh, and so for me to now uh, get him moving laterally and twisting is, is really crucial to, uh, you know, fulfill and basically alleviate a lot of the, the the pain of him coming back in and doing these uh these workouts he was doing and really changing it up is is going to be transformative for him well and the beauty of uh, the programming like when you if you take or you go through maps performance is that we take you through all those phases so i mean you're going to go through a, a strength phase you'll go through a hypertrophy type of phase an endurance type there's phase. an explosive phase it's the only program yeah. with an explosive phase right so it, you, it'll it, it, you know if you have all the it laid out for you so you go through all that and then you just you modify the weights to where you're at currently right now but your sal's right the the different types of movements that are in performance 
even if you're somebody who's been training for you know traditional weight training, it's foreign enough and novel enough that you're going to see some great results yeah. just from doing that. You know what is interesting about this? Uh, people like this though is that their your ability to handle work and workouts. It, does, it, it doesn't decline uh, until you're a little older than 50, much older. I mean, if you've ever met a 50-year-old construction worker or a 50-year-old farmer, uh, they will blow your mind yeah. how much their bodies can handle. Because they've been doing it for so long, mm -hmm. their work capacity is incredible. I've, I've, I, you know, I used to help my dad in construction uh, all the time, and you'd see these, these, guys, these men in their 50s who'd been doing it since they were teenagers – and you know, here I am. A, a t I'm a teenage kid yeah. myself. Uh, I'm pretty fit, and I'd go, and they'd blow me away yeah. by how much they could they're work just and do. Way more efficient. Yeah, too. they'd whistle while they're doing it and yeah. having a good time. And meanwhile, I'm like sweating my ass off, and I can barely breathe. And so, you'd be surprised at how long it takes before age starts to, especially if you've been doing it for 25 years, before age starts to force you to have to reduce things. Next question is from Jamil A144. If you had to remove the big three exercises, what could you replace them with that would be comparable? Oh. We, what are we going to say the big three are? A squat, squat dead, dead overhead dead press? Overhead no, press? well, they, bench, probably I, for what they, yeah, they usually, big three is usually bench press, yeah. squat, and uh, deadlift is usually what they say. Maybe we should do four, throw mm -hmm. in some overhead press if you yeah, want, because that's I, when I, I feel like that's a staple. Yeah, so do I. All right, this, this is easy for me. So uh, back squat, um, if I had to never do a back squat again, um, the exercise I would do as much as a back squat would be a front squat, in my opinion. Oh, uh, I would go Bulgarian. Well, I, I see the thing is, I that's still on the table, but the exercise to replace back squats for me would be front squat. I just mm. feel like it's close enough to providing the benefits of a back squat. Um, although a Bulgarian is is pretty damn good. It's yeah, I'm trying to think too. of something because first of all, why would you remove the big three? The only reason why you would remove the big three is maybe you don't have the barbell, right? And so yeah. how can I? I think it's just a hypothetical question, you know, just for yeah. shits and giggles. Yeah. Because the, I mean, if that's Let's get the, philosophical, yeah, if that's a, if that's the <laughs> case, then I can get on board a little bit with the front squat. Although I still, I, I what what I experienced, you know, and this was late later in my career of of really focusing on the Bulgarian split squat, the, the benefits that I got from that uh, were tremendous. And I saw uh, a lot of carryover into my squat, my leg size, uh, my stability, my hip mobility from it, yeah. my ankle mobility from it. Yeah. Uh, I just, I prefer that. We're, we're already so anteriorly driven. So doing something like a front squat. Yeah, over, I, you know, when I compare though, you're looking at the, the, the activation of the back, the low back, the ankle mobility, and then, you know, from watching Olympic lifters who are the best front squatters in the world, mm. these guys are front squatting tremendous amounts of weight. And that's what a back squat's great at. A back squat is amazing because you can load the hell out of it. Yeah. So it makes it one of the best exercises. I think the front squat is closer to that. Like, you could load the hell. You can get really, really good at front squats. Well, where you do you can. stand on this, Justin? Yeah. Well, I've actually seen athletes, like, really load heavy Bulgarian squats. Fuck yeah, you can. Yeah, and so it's... It's interesting uh, to to speculate about because it, if that is like you you prize that as much as a, a backloaded squat, uh, I've seen athletes actually really take off uh, in their strength gains and their stability simultaneously. So I think that like uh, from an athletic perspective, from an athletic perspective yeah. and it, functional perspective, yeah, I sure, think. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, but I I mean I love the front squat too. It's just I think that I would probably lean more in the Bulgarian. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, the next exercise would be the uh, deadlift. That's easy for me. Uh, and I don't know if this is cheating, but I do a trap bar deadlift. Is, is that too close? I know, right? Can I pick that? Yeah, I feel like that's too close. <laughs> is it too close? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I think it's different enough. How about a hip thrust? For a deadlift? Ooh. Oh, no. No, uh, no, nah, no, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Or, or or a barbell row. I mean, you got to do something. You got to. We got to do something for. So you got to pick something up heavy. Yeah. Well, you got to do something for the back, right? Yeah. So I mean, you got to do a big mover for the back. If yeah, you're but deadlifts are like hips. It's you know. It's, well, it's yeah. That's so why many, it's irreplaceable. It's irreplaceable. If I had to re ir get rid of it, the barbell row. Just doing the barbell row, you get some of the glute, hip, hamstring stabilization to hold that position. So mm. it's not being eliminated. So yeah. there's there's value in doing a 135 
bent over row, your hips are involved, your glutes are involved. They're not moving and they're not flexing, but they're at least in a in, they're in a, a, a isometric hold in that position. I'm just trying and you're to th- rowing big weight on your back. I'm just trying to hmm. think of right now the strength that you get from a deadlift. You know, I think obviously trap bar deadlift. You guys say that's cheating. I, I can kind of see that because it's so similar. Right. Uh, farmer heavy farmer walks would be up there for me because hmm. of the kind of strength that like it that. provides. It's yeah. kind of similar to a deadlift. Uh, you're right. Yeah, because it's a an all encompassing kind of a uh, strength that you're you're getting out from the deadlift. Like it's, so I think that the farmer walk actually does sort of uh, accomplish a similar, uh, you know, type of uh, you know body response because you're stabilizing everything at once yeah. with in your heavy weight, especially if you're like really loading it heavy. I mm-hmm. think that that's well. Valuable. That's my case for the bent over barbell row. The bent over barbell row is going to get the hamstring and glute involved in the stabilization. The lower back is extremely. Is, is in there. It's just like a, a, far, a farmer carry, the stabilization that you're getting with heavy load. You do that with a heavy barbell, you're getting all mm. that in the hips and the hamstrings and then low back. Yeah. And then in addition to that, you're rowing and getting the lats and rhomboids involved. The barbell row yeah. would have to be the exercise. That well, I but would. here's the thing though. I, it, it doesn't mean you can't do other back exercises. You know what I'm saying? Like we're replacing the deadlift, but does that mean, okay, so let's say we, we pick the farmer's walk. That means you can still do pull-ups. You could still do dumbbell right. rows. You could still do. It's just you never do deadlifts again. Yeah, that's yeah. the question. And if I never did deadlifts again, but I still had access to all these other exercises, the one that I would replace it with, and if I can't pick a trap bar, I'm thinking again farmer walk. I just mm. just the kind of strength that I get from the deadlift. You know, I, that's a tough one though. I think that's it, the hardest one. That to is replace. a hard one. Bench press. Uh, is it cheating if I say incline? Yeah. Incline press? Or yeah. dumbbells. Yeah. I mean, is that cheating? Because I feel like those are great. Well, you kind of got to remove the barbell, I would think. You know? Okay. Yeah. So if we, we do like dumbbell, bench, incline, yeah, I'll heavy. Take du- I'll take dumbbell, incline, bench all day. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even a dumbbell flat. You know what's funny? You take out the barbell bench press. You're not missing much. That's, I, I know. Mean, I hate it's, to say it, but if you just never did it and all you did were, you know, D- dumbbells and incline and dips. You'll be fine. Yeah, you're going to be okay. You would miss barbell squats and you would definitely miss uh, deadlifts. deadlifts. Yeah. Now, overhead barbell press. I mean, again, what are we going to say? You know, dumbbell press overhead? <laughs> it's kind of the same exercise. Well, yeah, you have because there's nothing that, I'm, or at least I'm drawing a blank right now of like getting you in full overhead extension. You can't, you can't eliminate that movement. That's such no. an important movement that you have. And if you're saying that you if can't you never do it, you're yeah, screwed. Yeah, you have to do it. And a front delt raise and a lateral, none of those come close to that. Like it's a not, handstand push up is not going to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. That's Although, not, although, that's good. Does, actually, um, although that's a good, actually, that would be good. I know, but like you're just dealing with body weight is, is the only thing. It's, it's definitely very, very challenging and it, and it sort of ter- obviously turns it up on its head, right? But uh, yeah, it's a very similar movement. I like that. I Honestly, that's because I was drawing a blank on, because I'm looking for something that you're getting your full extent, you're fully extended over your head. That's the, that is the most important yeah. part yeah. for everybody. Why that movement belongs in yeah. every routine is because we lose that just very of of all the things too that's up there with the the things that I think we lose the fastest. That's I, mean, I that's what yeah. I used to see in my older clients. Yeah, it was yeah. one of the number one aside from not being able to squat, not be able to you know do their posture. They couldn't reach straight not, up above. Not their head. even older. I, I found this in myself. That was one of the limiting factors why I didn't do overhead press. I mean, I was in my twenties and I already had to arch my low back to get full extension. I mean, we are just so all rounded, right? We're all yeah. so forward. We're always reaching in front. Yeah, and if you're not training that, it's really, really tough for you to try and get that back, you know, and it takes a lot of work to get back to that place. So yeah, the, Justin, I actually think the the old yeah, standing it actually does make sense. I can't I mean, think but, of anything else yeah. that would would incorporate. Is a kettlebell a, overhead press count, or is that still? Well, too? yeah, I, yeah. And see, my brain would would go more for the spiral line type of a press with a kettlebell, just because it's a different uh, load, but it's more favorable uh, functional. I or, like the kettlebell overhead press more than dumbbell overhead press. I and, do, I, and you, I if you, you asked me five years ago, I would have never said that. But or, now or that I've your, done them enough, your yeah. overhead carries, overhead carries, overhead carries with the with kettlebells yep, would be sure. Phenomenal. I do those a lot with my son you know that because that full extension is yes. such a difficult thing yeah. so we just practice walking with a single dumbbell or two dumbbells overhead great exercise and it keeps that 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 full extension now we're re-emphasizing like the importance of that so your body is going to be able to keep that yeah. after riding strong and training strong too i became a huge fan of circus presses that Did was you? that was not like a ever a a common movement for me I love that. I was doing them just the other day again. Like that, that exercise because yeah. you get you get to use a little bit of body English to get the weight up there, so yeah. I can go yeah, a, a high low. And when I think about it, like 
it, you would kind of get like to get a, a really heavy weight up over your head. You kind of would kind of have to throw it up. You would, and you yeah. would kind of you know use whatever leverage you could to push over your head. Like you wouldn't have this strict perfect. That's form. a fun exercise. It though. is a it's a fun exercise. It's a good exercise. I feel a lot of core stability in there. A lot of shoulder stability in there. I, that's a that's a up there with one of my favorites. Next question is from Coach Carruthers. What were some of the resources you read or studied that had an impact on your current program? Oh my gosh! You know, so here's the thing. Okay, we uh, Maps Anabolic. I created uh, what was it back in what 2013. 13. Okay, and then you know Maps Performance and Aesthetic and Split and Strong. All the other programs we all created together. What went into writing those programs? Decades of experience between <laughs> yeah. all of us. So you're looking at you know. 60 years of experience. If we don't even count Doug, you can throw in another 20 years on top of it. With, even all, the, we, with all the studies with, and all the certifications. With right. studies, mm -hmm. certifications, with reading, with training so many different clients and training ourselves, that's what went into the programs. So if I listed all the stuff that I, that yeah. I read. Not I mean, only, but not only that, like I, I know where this person is going like with this. Like, oh, you know, you guys, you the way you have your frequency or the choices of exercises, like what studies led to that? And it, it wasn't a study that led to any one of those single decisions. It's, it's a culmination. It's concepts. Yes. I think it's all these concepts that we were exposed to. We tried with our clients. We saw successes by doing certain uh, methods that we learned and gone through certification courses and things. And we're like, I really like this for this specific reason. And so I would take certain uh, types of, of you know, mobility moves and, and be like, this is going to be a great assessment. Did, and so I would, you know, look at things like that as I was going through these courses. This, so, so yesterday I get a DM from someone. So I guess uh, Mike Matthews, good friend of ours, right? Um, owns the supplement company, company Legion, also writes some good fitness books, knows his stuff. Mike Matthews is one of the better, I'd say, fitness authorities uh, that, that there are today. Uh, but Mike Matthews interviewed, uh, what's his name? Menno Hel Helmsman? I don't know how to say his name. Anyway, Big guy, bodybuilder guy? No, he's, he, this guy does lots of studies and training for people uh, for a long time. Uh, uh. He was on his podcast and the debate was full body workouts versus body part splits. Now mm. we know Mike Matthews is a big fan of body part splits. Menno is full body. And if you ask a lot of coaches and trainers who've trained a lot of people over a long period of time, they say full body. So I get this DM and he's like, you know, I love Mike and I love you and you guys are so smart. And But, uh, but you know, Mike, he leans more towards splits. And why does he do that when you guys are always talking about full body? And I said, look, I said, mm. Mike is extremely knowledgeable, very smart. The guy reads everything and he knows how to disseminate it and break down the studies and pick what is actually working, what's not working. Now, we've done that as well, but we also combine that with lots of experience training lots and lots and lots of people, and that's why we get the – that's why we have our opinion. There's a behavioral component in all of our decisions. Like the, when I think about the core – At the end of the day, it's what works. When, right? I, when I think of the core principles of the programming that we've done, like uh, obviously all the research around periodization. So if you read all the research around periodization, you'll get the understanding of why we phase the workouts. If you read all the research on the, the exercises that are the most valuable, the biggest bang for your buck to show the most results, everything from CNS to building muscle to burning fat to burning calories, you'll see why we, we picked yeah. all the exercises. So the core of all of our and, programs. And then after that, then we have taken into account Oh, then frequency would be another one, right? There are all the all the studies that are around frequency oh, and the tempo, of that. Yes. You know, you know, so those, volume. Those to me are like the, the really good the, as far as like the research, right? Is there? Then after that, then we all sit here and we go back and forth on what we've seen. Yes. You know, and we and we take into account like the, so something some study might say, oh, this is the best for this, but then we go, well, wait a second, how many of the clients did you ever train yeah. stuck to that for longer than two yeah. weeks? Yeah, or, that never works. Right. Exactly. And how do those flow together in the workout? Because you know, everything written on paper is completely different I'll, than actually applying it in person, watching somebody go through it. Yeah, I'll make a silly example. Let's say a study comes out tomorrow and it says, you know, cardio at four AM fasted for 45 minutes, burned 15% more fat than cardio at any times, any other times of the day. Then you'd get the research uh, you know, junkies who come out and be like, this is how you should do cardio. This is what I prescribe. 45 minutes at 4 a.m. because here's what the study said. Me as a trainer is going to say, don't do that. I've never had any client that's ever done 45 minutes of cardio at 4 a.m. every single day. Forever. It just doesn't work. <laughs> right. So. They're not going to do it forever. Yeah, so it's not right. worth the 15% because you're going to get 0% right. because you're never going to do it. That's a, that's a silly example, uh, well, but I made it very clear. Another good example is what you're talking about with the body part split versus the uh, full body argument. We just made, we, we talk about it at nauseum on this podcast. 
And it's because the reality of it is nobody ever trains like a perfect study does, where you don't miss anything, you go perfect, you you measure at the volume, everything's all... No, everybody, very few people are doing that. Most people are going how they feel. Most people have shit that happens. They get sick, they miss a day. And so you have to factor all that in and, and consistency with whatever they're going to do is really important. So if you have somebody who's on a body part split and they're like 80% of the population who goes consistent for a couple weeks or maybe in a couple months and then falls off the wagon and then comes back, what you end up finding out is like over the course of months and years, somebody who follows a full body routine ends up hitting the muscle groups more frequently, which ends up giving them more results over in the big picture, not just in a six week yeah. study. And it's also this other factor that nobody ever considers, which is just the practice, the practice of right. the same exercises over and over and getting good at them. That's why it makes them so effective. Full body workouts do that. So I'm going to list certain books that have been more influ influential than others. Now, as a kid, I read all the magazines. When I say all, I literally, I mean, I had my first job at, well, I was working with my dad at the age of 13, and then I got, you know, jobs at restaurants after that washing dishes. And I, I literally subscribed to Iron Man, Muscle and Fitness, Flex Magazine, Muscle Mag, Muscle Media 2000. And I think that's it. I had five uh, muscle magazine uh, subscriptions. So I read all of them all the time. Those had a lot of influence. And although they were big pamphlets to sell supplements, essentially, there was some articles in there that were pretty smart. And so I, I, I did learn some stuff. Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Very, very impactful because it literally listed all of the, definitely all of the free weight exercises for every body part. So I learned all the exercises that you could do with free weights at a very young age from that book because I was able to study it. Uh, Mike Menser's Heavy Duty was another book uh, that had a huge impact, mainly because he positioned an argument which was, hey, if you do way less volume, do more intensity, you'll get the same results. Now, it's not, what he said wasn't 100% correct, but it did get me to question certain things and look at the way that I, I would design my workouts. Um, uh, Dinosaur Training uh, was another book that I, I learned a lot from. Um, and then old publications. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about turn of the century, like first the strong men uh, of, of, you know, the, of the early 1900s, you know, watching how they Eugene worked out. Eugene Sandow and you know, your Charles Atlases and all those. You know, I, I was totally, uh, uh, you know, researching all that stuff too. Like I loved old strength uh, journals and, and ways that like people did it back in the day uh, before, you know, we had this this surge of like uh, anabolic steroids and, and different ways of, uh, you know, organizing the gym with with machines. It's like, what did we used to do? And so I got into that. I got into Dr. Ed Thomas's work. He was really like movement focused. Uh, Greg Cook, you know, Eric Cressy. Uh, you know, like uh, lots of the sports uh, specific type uh, uh, trainers out there that put out really good information. So uh, you, one of, another one was Super Training by Mel Siff, yeah. which is uh, where they we finally got information about everything, you know, from, uh, you know, Russian studies. Yeah. And, you know, it's just stuff like that. If you if you look look at, towards your, your interest. And so obviously I had an interest in movement and specifically in, uh, you, you know, athletic pursuits. Well, another area that we, none of us mentioned right now that is taken into consideration all the programs is like uh, mobility and movement. So like books like supple leopard or mm. certifications like Ken stretch or Eldoa yes. or FRC, oh, like, yeah. things like that are also taken into consideration when, when we're programming, because it's not just about the X's and O's on everything. It's also about just learning to teach people to move better and, then, and all the deficiencies and dysfunction that we saw for all those years. So things like that are taken into consideration when we choose certain exercise or exercise order because we know the habits and behaviors of people. Yeah, so, and here's what, what else is really cool is that, you know, and I loved it when I met um, uh, Adam and Justin because I had met two other fanatics about fitness uh, that were similar to my level of fanaticism. They, they would look at some different things, but they studied it with the same level of passion. And so what you get is you get, you know, sometimes people get stuck at just listening to advice from one type of strength athlete, like bodybuilder or power lifter or, you know, yoga expert. You know, one thing that I did is, and I did this later on and I, it was so impactful, was I studied how power lifters trained. And then I studied how Olympic lifters trained. Mm -hmm. And then I'd read about kettlebell, you know, type training. And then I'd read about martial arts and, and calisthenics type training. And all of this, you get all these nuggets of wisdom 
from these old forms of training. Powerlifting's been around for a long time. So is bodybuilding. So is Olympic lifting, kettlebell training even longer. You're going to get like aspects and, and, and things that you can learn from each of them apply to your training. So what you see in our programs is a culmination of – it's like our programs, and although all of them are designed for specific avatars, like for example, MAPS Performance – Build muscle, but move well. We we like to use the ancient athlete as the as the avatar. But what you really have are the mixed martial arts of muscle building programs. We pick the best from each category and injected what works so well in each category. And so what you end up with is a very well balanced body that builds muscle, avoids plateaus, and. And it feels phenomenal. I also feel like we broke down a lot of barriers that we saw. I remember this was a lot of the motivation on the podcast is, you know, to your point, Sal, about how we tend to gravitate towards, you know, one professional or one expert in a field. And then we we, we marry that ideology. Mm-hmm. And it and then and then what the fitness space does is they they separate everybody and it's my way is better than your way because that's it's what all made, versus yeah because that's that's what sells better right that's I'm, I'm trying to sell my ideas that my way of training or my modality is better than your modality and just the three of us didn't subscribe to that belief like yeah. because we had so much experience in all different aspects we studied all different ways of training we saw the value of all of it and it wasn't like oh this guy's more right than that guy it's like no they're they're all right in their own in their own right and there's something to take from all of those and really when you look at the the the, the entire collection of all the maps programs they are there's there's pieces of all of that in every one of those programs because none of us subscribe to one ideology dude it's like you know uh, like like uh, you know bruce lee was a, quite a bit of a philosopher when it came to martial arts and he was one of the first martial artists to say here's what kung fu does and that's really well and oh look at the way that boxers dance and their footwork and look how they use the jab and look how wrestlers change levels and are able to control a fight on the ground and look at submissions and leverage and all that stuff and i mean all of those things make you a really good uh fighter right so mm-hmm. that's really the big thing uh that you want to you want to take out of this even if your goal is just to build a lot of muscle man you don't think power lifters build muscle or Olympic lifters build muscle or kettlebell athletes build muscle. You don't think mobility helps you build muscle? Like all those things contribute to better performance and better results. And so, you know, it's studying all of those things. I think that's gone into each and every MAPS program. Look, uh, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come tune in on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Well, so I, I have two thoughts on this. Uh, one, I understand your position with with uh, having a child. You know, when we started Mind Pump, I was a, a, in a different position than when I had started uh, other businesses. You know, when I opened my wellness studio, I was I think twenty three years old. Um, you know, I didn't have any kids.